ITP Education. And last but not least, Mr. Le Kukit, Hello Language Center. Also, we welcome all the presenter and participant of language teaching and learning today, 2018. Honorable guests, distinguished speakers, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to invite to the stage President of Ho Chi Minh City, University of Technology and Education, uh, Professor, Associate Professor Dr. Do Van Jung, to come to the stage and deliver the welcoming speech. Honorable guests, distinguished speakers, scholars, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, our great honor to welcome you all to Language Teaching and Learning Today 2018 held at Ho Chi Minh City University of Technology and Education, SCMUT. As you should have known, SCMUT is one of the most renowned and dynamic universities for training and research in Vietnam. It is committed to offering quality training services and fostering effective space for innovations. We have several programs accessed by AUNQA and the institution accredited at the national level. Along with the striving process of bringing fresh troops to the training services at the University, LTLT 2018 is proudly organized. This annual conference is a public forum for academics, researchers, lecturers, and stakeholders at different levels of their professional careers within the area of language teaching and learning to share research findings, provoke innovative ideas for classroom practice, and shape direction for the new research. This year, LTLT 2018 seeks to understand the diversity and unity of different teaching and learning practices in the globalized context of language education. The event is a forum for both local in science and international perspective to be shared and analyzed for better understandings and more effective practice of the field. Nowadays, the industrial revolution for body role comes to us everywhere. Every student comes to class to a smartphone and remains connected during class time at the physical room. Students can read the materials that teachers have never heard about. They may be exposed to a variation of English that the teachers have never experienced. This conference is therefore able to address the challenges and opportunity when we live in, we are living in the digital area with the artificial intelligence. Therefore, we look forward to learning from your discussions during conference and hope that this forum will, would uh, mo motivate more efficient changes of language education in the context of Vietnam and in other countries. Once again, Welcome to SCMUT. Thank you for your participation and enjoy the conference. Have a good stay in Ho Chi Minh City. Thank you, Associate Professor Dr. Do Văn Dũng for a remarkable speech. 
We are now going to listen to the opening speech delivered by Dean of Faculty of Foreign Languages, Ho Chi Minh City University of Technology and Education. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Dang Tang Ting. Distinguished guests, scholars, presenters, sponsors, participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is our privilege to welcome so many professionals, scholars, researchers, colleagues, students, and stakeholders in the area of English language teaching and learning joining the conference today. Language teaching and learning today is an initiative of the foreign uh, language faculty, Ho Chi Minh City University of Technology and Education, in facilitating and empowering the professional community of language education and research. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome you all to our second conference on language teaching and learning today 2018. The main program was expanded from half a day during the, in the last year to a full day of this year. We are very proud to host 50 presentations, including research papers, training workshops, and poster presentations. These are the most rigorous studies that are strongly recommended by our reviewers. The conference is honored with the participation of over 300 participants from various parts of Vietnam and around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Language Teaching and Learning Today 2018 aims at exploring the diversity and unity of different teaching and learning practices in the globalized context of language education. This forum is to offer researchers and practitioners from different teaching and learning contexts like you a unique opportunity to share your local insights and dialogues with other international perspectives. The conference is highlighted by a keynote speech of a linguist from Malaysia and four featured presentations of colleagues from Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam. Provided with different challenges of globalized learning contacts, the conference is urged to consider the ease of technology access, the influence of foreign cultures, the dominance of digital citizens in every classroom setting. The developmental process that learners need to integrate their local values with those of their counterparts from the virtual space is also investigated. In addition, the learning behaviors and attitudes of the Z generation are examined. Their communicative needs are then studied to understand the contradictions between teaching practices and learning preferences for the promotion of a more appropriate training modes and services. To finish this introduction to the conference, I would like to express my sincere thanks to the organizing team, the reviewers, guest speakers, presenters, students, volunteers, and other colleagues for their amazing dedications to the event. I would also like to thank the sponsors for their generous sponsorships, particularly the gold sponsors for the conference, including IDP Education, Hello English Center, and Dai Trung Phak Education. Our appreciation is also extended to Macmillan Education, Cambridge University Press and Cảnh Quang Việt for supporting the conference.
Thank you for the media team of Ho Chi Minh City University of Technology and Education for covering the event and getting it on air. Finally, please allow me to thank all special guests and participants from different institutions for coming and sharing with us your expertise today. I wish you all the best and hope that you, in, you will enjoy LTLT 2018 to the fullest. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dang Tinh Tinh, for the remarkable speech. Uh, as the Dean already mentioned, events like this would not be possible without our dear sponsor uh, for your generosity and your long-term cooperation. Now, I would like to invite the representative from our dear sponsor to the stage to receive the flowers as well as the certificates of recognition from our uh, conference organizers. Now, please come to the stage. Hello Language Center, representative from Hello Language Center, IDP Education, Dai Trung Pha, Macmillan Education, Cambridge University Press, and Cảnh Quang Việt. Please come to the stage to receive the flowers and the certificates from the conference organizer. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Dang Tung Tin, the Dean of Faculties of Foreign Languages, University of Technology and Education, to come to the stage, please. Thank you, sponsor. Thank you, Dr. Dang Tang Ting. Another important force to contribute to the success of this conference is the speakers. It's my pleasure to invite on stage the keynote and four plenary speakers to receive flowers and gifts from the conference organizer. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Dr. Stephanie Pillai, Dr. Lê Thị Thuy Nhung, Dr. Nguyễn Thủy Thư Loan, Dr. Bùi Thị Thục Quyên, and Dr. Made Henry Santosa. My invite on stage, uh, Dr. Đặng Tăng Tính, uh, to present the flower and give to the honorable speakers.
Thank you, um, speakers. Thank you, Dr. Dang Tân Tín. We are now continuing our conference to the next agenda, that is to hear our keynote speakers uh, given by Dr. Professor Stephanie Pillai. The keynote speech will be moderated by Dr. Nguyen Dinh Thu, former Dean of Faculties of Foreign Languages, University of Technology and Education. Dr. Thu, please. Distinguished guests, presenters, participants, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to be here to make the, a short introduction to the, our keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Stephanie Pillay from University of Malaysia. Uh, Professor Dr. Stephanie Pillay, currently Dean of Faculty of Languages and Linguistics, University of Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur. Trained as the teachers of English from universe, uh, United Kingdom, uh, Stephanie joined the University of Malaysia as the language teacher in 1993 and became the lecturer in the same year. She was an awardee of the Commonwealth this side, the PhD, completing her tenure at University of Newcastle, University, uh, UK. She was the 2017 Bill Bansomer Asian Scholar at Chant, 2017, and also the Ian Gordon Fellow at the School of Linguistic and Applied Language Studies at Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Her main research uh, interests are the segmental and prosodic features of uh, spoken Malaysian English and Malacca Portuguese. Noticeable work on the Malacca Portuguese was funded by and has been archived in the Endangered Languages Archive. She has also been working on the capacity building for language documentation with Professor Peter Austin of the School of Asian Studies, UK, under the Newton Onku Alma Fellowship. Stephanie uh, published extensively in Asian Industries, English Today, Studies in Second Language Acquisition, World Industries, Language Sciences, and Language Communication. Uh, please uh, give Professor Dr. Stephanie Pillay a warm welcome. Right, thank you. We just set up a little bit. Okay, so, yes, I think that's so. Okay, while they're doing that, I'd just like to wish everyone a really good morning. And thank you so much to the organizing committee for inviting me to Vietnam. This is my first time. Um, and you guys have amazing food. <laughs> very, very lovely food. Thank you. Okay, we're almost there. All right, I'm going to be a typical teacher and not stand behind the podium, okay? Um, again, thank you very much for having me here. And today, what I'm going to share with you is about globalizing English language. Um, and essentially, what I'm going to do is I will tell you about the Malaysian situation, but I think that Vietnam has also experienced something very similar to what we are going through right now, maybe with different rates of success, okay? So, um, I'll, I'll be covering 
a little bit about English and employability. The reason why we are all so fixated with learning English, I saw all the IELTS schools, a lot of language schools in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, English is a big business, right? And we have to ask ourselves why we are, we are doing so much of English in our countries um, in Southeast Asia and in many other parts of the world. And then I will look at what countries like Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, um, in particular Malaysia, okay, what have we been doing? Because we want to um, address the issue of English language for our country. So we must be doing something about it, right? And lastly, related to this doing something is decisions that we make about going native or going global. So I think that fits in with the theme of today's, um, of, of the conference, diversity, unity, okay? Um, which, one, which one are we going for? So, um, I want to focus on one study, okay, that looked at four different countries, okay, and in this study, employers said that they value graduates with English language skills, okay, and they prefer graduates with English language communication skills. Now, so this is something that's going to come out again and again. This is not something new, but I want to emphasize this, um, this insistence on English. Where is it coming from? Who says that our graduates must be fluent in English? Somebody must be telling us to do it, right? Otherwise, we won't have a job, you and I. Okay. So, in another study, it's not just non-native non speaking countries. I don't like that word, but I'll use that. Um, in Australia, Okay, studies have shown that for international students, all right, um, employers also expect graduates to have very good English language skills for employability. So my emphasis is this, English language, employability. Okay? In other countries, Nigeria, Cameroon, Rwanda, Pakistan, Bangladesh, you get very similar findings. One employees are required to speak English. So this is feedback from employers, okay? Two, employees who speak English tended to earn more. Now, this is another important thing that I want to highlight. The fact that it's not just employers saying, yeah, you know, we want our employees to speak English. Employees who speak English can earn more than those who don't speak English very well, okay? I want you to keep that in mind because that has implications for all our countries' socio-economic standing and status of our graduates as well. Okay? Three, and those with a good command of English are more likely to be promoted compared to those without. Okay? And these are in these countries, so, so many different countries. Right. And how about Malaysia? Okay? In Malaysia, no different. The story is the same. Employers keep complaining every year. They keep complaining about the same things. You, graduates can't get jobs. We can't hire your graduates, especially those from local universities, because of their English. Okay? Um, and they keep saying, what are you guys doing at the university? Your graduates can't speak good English. They can't communicate in English. Okay, um, so here comes the problem, right? Okay. So, sure, you can speak proper English, ma. Why cannot? Okay, so this is the kind of English that you might hear on the streets of Kuala Lumpur, okay? Um, so, again, from the employers, this is a study carried out by Talent Corp and World Bank that lack of communication skills is one of the most, the highest rate, one of the highest rated reasons for unemployment in Malaysia. Okay, and same thing you find by other um, surveys. I think some of you are familiar with Job Street. Yeah, okay, it's a job portal, um, and the Malaysian Employers Federation. Same reason. The top three, top five reasons for employee of four graduates not getting jobs, English, okay? So, 
one of the studies we did when we had um, employers in a focus group also had similar findings, okay? The first and the most important skill they want employees to have, communication skills, okay? And for those of you who are students here, you, you might want to pay attention to this, right? That this is what employers actually want. You should be able to communicate, you should be articulate in English, um, you, you should be able to put your thoughts into writing or into oral presentations in English, okay? And this is the fundamental starting point for them. They say, if you have English, we can groom you, all right? This is from the employers, not, not from me, okay? Um, now, this brings a big issue. English, in, at least in Malaysia, and in many of our countries, and I suspect increasingly so in Vietnam as well, English is being used as a gatekeeping tool. Okay? And again, I want to go back to what I said earlier. English is related to socioeconomic standing of the individual and of the country. Because sometimes as teachers, we don't see the big picture, right? We just look at our students and the classes that we go to. And as students, you only see yourselves as, oh, I'm just doing my course, I'm just doing, I have to do English, it's part of my degree. But you don't look at the big picture of what's going to happen to you when you leave university. So at the entry level, so when you finish your degree, and our students finish their degrees, um, where, what happens is their ability or your ability to communicate in English and your level of English language proficiency now, right? That will determine whether you actually even get the job. Hang on. That might even mean or, or it, it may affect your ability to even be called for an interview. So maybe you won't even be called for the interview. So forget about even getting a chance, right? Um, or if you're called for the interview, they listen to your English, they look at your skills and say, ah, no. Your university said you got an A for your business communication. But when we interviewed you, you could barely even talk to us in English. So, sorry. Next. Okay? So, entry level. You get stopped there. Okay. And at the workplace, if your company is a multinational company, is a global company, or if you work in other countries in Southeast Asia or other parts of the world, English might be the language of the workplace, right? Because you have people from different countries and so you're operating, the language that you operate in or the employees operate in is going to be English. So you need to be able to conduct meetings or contribute at meetings. Perhaps you need to present in English, all right? And then you need to write emails and signs for your company. And the result is when we have employees who are not very... Um, fluent or proficient in English, we get things like this. This is very common, right? In Malaysia, anyway. Deadline for registration for the conference. Instead of, what should it be? Instead of date line, what should it be? If you answer me, you might get a prize. <laughs> Okay. It is deadline, right? But, but this is very common. And you might think, ah, you know what, we all understand it, so it doesn't matter. But then you see you get some, this was at, a, at our airport, right? At our airport, and we had this, okay? Um, wishing you a Merry Christmas. Merry as in, hello Mary, you know. Um, and we thought maybe they're playing on the words because, you know, after all, Mary was the one who gave birth to Jesus. Okay, so anyway, that's a bad joke, but yeah. Oops. See, I should not make jokes like this, right? It totally went off. Oh dear. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Right. Okay. Um, so, can you... I should not make religious jokes. This is what happens. So bear with me and all will be forgiven, I hope. Okay, right. So the, the point is, empl employers, including myself, right, at the University of Malaya, we have to do a lot of things bilingually because we have international students, international staff. 
okay? Um, when your colleagues cannot write emails and so on in English that is, you know, grammatically correct, for example, or they're not able to get the message across, it's a lot of work for the superiors or the bosses because they have to check through everything, every email that goes out, every sign that goes out. Okay? We are regret to inform you that the Viva is cancelled, for example. Okay? Now, if that's going out from my faculty to an international um, you know, board of examiners, it represents my faculty, it re represents my organization. And this is why companies are also reluctant to hire people that they feel cannot represent them because of their low level of English. Okay? So everything is related. Why companies at the entry level have this gatekeeping for it and use English as a gatekeeping tool. And then why employees who then join companies don't get promoted or don't get paid extra if their English is not up to the level that the company requires, okay? So this is nothing new. For those of us who've been in education long enough, and for those of you who are employers here today, this is nothing new, right? English, the fact that English is related to employability, English is related to promotion opportunities, English is related to you getting a higher pay is not something new, okay? But what are we doing about it? Because for Malaysia, and this is, this is true of many other countries, okay, the reports that I shared with you earlier, and I suspect, again, it is going to be the same in Vietnam as well, that because of this, when your people cannot do the jobs, that they're supposed to do and they cannot engage globally or at least companies consider that your graduates are not good enough because their English is at a low level, that influences the, the, the whole economic situation or social situation of your nation. So if your country, like Malaysia, want to go towards being a developed nation but we do not have the people the human capacity to do so. How are we going to achieve that status, right? And the Federation of Malaysian Manuf um, Employee Manufacturers is also concerned. They said that if we can't do this, then how are we going to achieve developed status? Okay, it's not just about building, 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 right? Or having great highways or, you know, modern transport system. Yeah, that's all important. But what about the people? What about the human capital? Okay? So, in Malaysia, just to explain um, a little bit, for those who come to university, okay, before coming to university, they would have had 11 to at, at least minimum of 11 years of English language education. Right? From primary one to primary six, Secondary one to secondary, the, the fifth year, so form one to form five. Okay, so at least 11 years of English language education. So you would think after all that English, hey, they should be okay, right? They should be okay to go into higher education and do their courses in English, okay? Or they can then enter the job market or from secondary school enter the job market maybe work in hotels, in the tourism industry. Well, and if we can achieve that, then we have a society that is more equal, right? There is not so much of a gap between those who can and cannot, those who have and those who haven't got um, a good education, a solid job, okay? Um, they'll be able to work abroad, they can go overseas, they don't have to just work in Malaysia, or they can work in multinational companies. And remember what I said earlier, because if you have English, you get the job. If you have English, you get promoted more, you know, your chances at getting promoted are higher, and you may get a higher pay, which means that in terms of dollars and cents, or whatever your currency is, you should be better off than those who don't have English and your opportunities to work in multinational companies or to work in 
other ASEAN countries or abroad yeah, are higher. Okay. Okay. So, problem. That is the ideal situation, right? So after 11 years of English education, Malaysian students should have a high level of English. Okay. But in Malaysia, we have at the primary school level, we have three mediums of instruction. We have a Malay medium, which is the most common. This is government education, yeah? Okay. We have Chinese medium of instruction, Mandarin, and we have Tamil medium of instruction, okay? And at the secondary level, we have Malay medium of instruction. So our children are coming from different educational backgrounds. So you can see there's going to be an issue already. Okay, they're not coming at the same level. Okay? Now, we have at the moment in Malaysia, we have so many policies. Okay? One of the current policies now is um, to allow what we call a dual language program. So schools can choose if they want to offer um, science and math um, and related subjects in English. Okay, they can choose. So some schools have gone on this um, using the dual language program. And some schools just stick to being Chinese, Malay, Tamil, or Malay in secondary school level. Okay? So that's the current situation. So it's not like everyone goes through exactly the same medium of instruction. The curriculum is the same. So this is national schools, government schools, national curriculum. Okay. I want to show you what's happened. Okay. We have another issue. Okay. And why I'm showing you this is because it is related to English language education. Now, apart from the government schools, because Malaysia has aspirations, we have an agenda to be an international education hub. So, we now allow many, many international schools to be set up. In fact, we have more than 120 international schools. Okay. Um, we have, that this, this was last year, so by now we definitely have more than 71,000 students enrolled. This is the highest enrollment in Southeast Asia. Okay, highest. And in terms of number of students, this is what I want to highlight to you. Um, look at the number of Malaysians in international schools. Now, most of these schools, the medium of instruction, what do you think the medium of instruction is? English, right? And the curriculum is obviously not the national curriculum because these schools will do whatever. Mostly, they do the British the Cambridge IGCSEs, okay? But it could be Canadian, it could be Australian, right? So it's not a national curriculum, all right? This is quite a big number going to international schools. Now, in terms of student profile now, we have the government schools on one hand, right? Where children do English as a subject. Some schools choose to do, to teach some subjects, science and math in English under the dual language program. Children are coming from different primary school, different, different medium of instruction in primary schools. Okay? Then you have the international school. Medium of instruction is generally English. Different curriculum, so they do everything in English in most of these schools. Who do you think can afford to go to these schools? Okay, so think, you don't have to answer me, but think in terms of student profile. Um, we don't have fees in government schools, but in international schools, you're going to pay a lot of money. And there are different levels of international schools, right? Most of these schools will be in urban areas. They're not going to be in rural areas, correct? Okay, so think about the student profile now. Kids going to these schools probably, probably already speak English at home because their parents would speak English and another language perhaps. So they may grow up bilingual or they may be dominantly English speaking Malaysians. Okay, so they have that advantage, right? They come from urban areas, they go to international schools and do everything in English, communicate with their friends mainly in English. Compare this to the government schools. Okay, what am I trying to say here? 
we have a profile. I wonder what's happening in Vietnam with your language schools, where those who can pay to learn English or to do your IELTS versus those who can't. Okay? Right. So, what are the universities? What's the government doing about this? Because we now go back to the first issue, which is employers complaining about um, graduates not having good English, right? English being used as a gatekeeping tool, English as an opportunity for pro job promotion, English as an opportunity for getting higher pay, right? And then we see, oh, hang on, there's a problem here. There's a social divide. It's not equal for all our children. That cannot be. So we have to do something to make sure that they can go from campus to career or school to career, right? Because, now going back to the big picture, it's not just about your individual children. It's not just about each of you here, whether you're a teacher or a student. It's national interest. It's about national interest, okay? So in Malaysia, this is our latest policy. We have a roadmap. And I know Vietnam kind of went through something similar. Thailand also has a similar plan for English language education. So the, in this roadmap, you can see that it's 2015 to 2025. We have certain goals okay, that we have set. Um, and basically, I think you're all familiar with CFR, yeah? So I'm not going to go through. But have a look at this and compare it to what your um, targets are, okay? So this is just targets that by 2025, this is our expectation, okay? Um, that students who come to university should graduate with a B2. That is very challenging for us when we have students coming in with A2 in three and a half years, A2 after 11 years of English language education, and how how are we, what are we going to do to make them leave university with at least a B2? Is that even possible? Well, that's the target, so we have to sort that out, yeah? Okay. And why CEFR? I know in Vietnam you also use this as a target, but do we ask, uh, ask ourselves why? Okay. In Malaysia, it is seen as a alignment to international standards so that everybody is on the same page, right? Everybody knows if you say, okay, this graduate is CFR, I don't know, B1. Everybody will know what that means rather than you come with, oh, University of Malaya's A versus University X's B. It doesn't make sense. So that's, and we are aligning, just to go back to this, we are aligning not just university education, we are aligning everything from preschool to higher education and we include, for the first time, teacher education as well. So it is a roadmap that's trying to look at English language education as a whole, okay? And it is already in its implementation stage, all right. Um, however, I also want to point out that Yes, you know the background of Sefer, right? I don't have to go through that with you, but I want you to think also that it was about can-do statements and it was supposed to be moving away from so-called native speaker targets. But what has happened is that it has... This is a danger of Sefer. And in Malaysia, we have to be very careful with this. We are still at the very initial stages. We have to be very careful that we do not become prescriptive and at the end of the day, we do not then go back to no more diversity. We talk about one target and it is a native speaker target. Okay, right. I am going to just very quickly, I think I was shown something that says I have to stop now, so I will very... Okay, I want to just talk about native speaker norms because we're talking about globalization, right? So do we really need to, to do this? Now, in ELSQ is the, the body, the English Language Standards of Malaysia. We have a council, and they are the ones who um, worked on the roadmap. They, they seem to feel that we need some kind of standard. They don't say it outright in the document. 
Okay? But if you read between the lines, it seems to be like, no, we need to be, we need to have a native speaker norm. And in the Malaysian context, the native speaker norm tends to be British English. Okay? Um, I have a little bit of a problem with that when it comes to pronunciation. So if you look at pronunciation in the Sefer document, you talk about a foreign accent. What is a foreign accent? So what, I have a foreign accent because I don't sound like the Queen. I don't want to sound like that, okay? What, mate? I don't want to, I want to sound like a Malaysian. Okay, and so I have an issue with this, and so I guess if I were to sit for a sefer, I wouldn't do so well in the spoken, um, you know, in, in, in the speaking test. I'll probably, I'll probably get a B1 or a B2, maybe, because I have such a Malaysian accent, right? Okay, um, so I want to very quickly, and I'm sorry I have to rush through this because we started a bit late. Um, I, I want us to think about it, okay? When we look at, it's very good to align to international standards, yes. But especially when it comes to speaking, perhaps there are more important things to work out. Okay, whether we understand each other. Um, because if we want to say that we expect all our students in Vietnam and Malaysia to all sound like someone who comes from the UK, and I would ask you, which part of the UK? Right? As if there is just one spoken English in the UK. You get into a, a cab or a taxi from Heathrow, you probably won't understand the British taxi driver, okay? Um, because of his accent. So what, he doesn't speak good English or you can't understand his English? What is the issue there, right? So, um, a lack of a native speaker accent should not be seen to, as lack of competence, okay? So in your when you do your test for speaking, you need to be very careful with this, okay? Because otherwise you get into all sorts of um, issues, right? Um, Lionel Weave calls this linguistic conservatism, you know, still local is bad and native speaker is good. Don't, not accepting that there are localized versions of English, okay? Um, and then in the, in the case of Malaysia, we come with so many different language backgrounds, right? We have, we have four major languages, but we really have over 70 to 80 languages that's, that children um, come speak, right? So we're not taking this diversity into account. And we talk about there is no one Malaysian English. There are several types of Englishes that we use in Malaysia. Okay, so if I were to speak with a fellow Malaysian, I wouldn't sound the same um, as how I'm speaking to you right now, right? You probably wouldn't understand me at all. But the thing is, I can switch, right? I can switch from one type of English to another kind of English. But for our students, we sometimes do not expose them to different kinds of Englishes. We do not give them the kind of repertoire or different Englishes that they can move from one English to another, from local English to a more globally intelligible English, right? So this is, rather than making them go towards one, you must speak like this and no other way of speaking is correct, okay? Um, so, something to think about, I'm just going to go very quickly through this, is that when it comes to English, at least for pronunciation, we have to be very careful because there really isn't one established standard. Trudgell talked about this, many people have talked about this, and I don't want to go into this. I'm just going to say this, there isn't one standard, okay? And in terms of Malaysian learners, like Vietnamese learners, I'm sure that the majority of us, our students are learning English from local teachers, yes? Okay, and many of the local teachers are trained locally have learned their English in the local context. So why, why do you expect these teachers and these students to speak with a somebody else's accent? Okay, right. So just to summarize, okay, when we talk about globalizing English as teachers, Right? We have to arm ourselves, we have to have the knowledge of the system. We have to have a certain proficiency as teachers. 
Because if you're a math teacher and you can't do math, you can't teach math, right? So as an English teacher, that is your, your skill, your tool. Having that means that you already can, you'll be a better teacher to share with your students. But that's not enough. You should also have them for all the different Englishes that they are going to hear. Right, that they may come into contact with, all right? And of course, as a teacher, it's not just enough to have that knowledge, right? You must have the heart and you must have the skills to carry, to teach in the classroom. So, so pedagogy is also important, okay? Um, if we don't have all of this, okay, then how are we going to prepare our students, whether in school or at university, how are we going to prepare them for the world outside? How are we going to address the issues that, um, you know, that employers keep complaining about? Five years from now, we will still hear the same problems. Graduates, not good enough. English, not good enough. We don't want that. If we want to do something about it, then we have to consider all these. Who will be the recipients, the students who are here? Why is it important? Well, I already told you why in terms of the job market. But more importantly, it also, it also has an effect on your economy, on the country as a whole, okay? So, with that, excel in English, but you don't have to be English, okay? And I would also just like to, to do a little bit of promo here. We are having a conference uh, 9, 10, 11 of July in, in my university. The conference itself is free. There's no registration fees, um, only fees for the, for the workshop. So please do visit the website to find out more, okay? And I think with that, I better end because I've been like waved at many, many times. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Dr. Stephanie Pillai, for your thought-provoking speech. If I may, I would like to introduce two more guests for our conference today. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Bat Le Ding of the Department of English, University of Foreign Languages, He University. Secondly, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Nguyễn Ngoc Minh Châu, Dean of University of Finance and Marketing. Now here comes our first library speech delivered by Dr. Lê Thủy Thủy Nhung. Dr. Lê Thủy Thủy Nhung completed her MA in Tissot Study in the University of Queensland, Australia, and her PhD in education at the University of Newcastle, Australia. She has published articles and book chapters in international publisher, including Rulash Publisher. Dr. Le is currently a division head at the Department of Foreign Languages, Banking University, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Her research include TISO, Teacher Professional Development, Language Policy, intercultural communication, and internalization of higher education. Yeah. Please. Dr. Nhung, please.
good morning, guests, uh, colleagues, students, and all the participation, uh, participants. Welcome to my presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Nhung from the Department of Foreign Languages, Banking University. I would like to take this opportunity to present in part the results of my doctoral thesis, which I completed uh, two years ago. Right. This is the topic of my presentation. My doctoral studies uh, investigated the experiences of students undertaking English medium courses in Vietnamese universities. Right. Uh, my presentation will cover the following topics. First, I will present some background of English medium instructions. Then I will present partly some results of my doctoral thesis with a focus on quality, qualitative research findings. And then I will close my presentation with some conclusions. First, have a look at the definition of medium of instruction. What is it? Medium of instruction refers to the language, for example, English, used to deliver the content of non-language subjects, for example, history, mathematics, uh, science at the secondary schools, and specialist subjects, for example, law business, engineering at the university level. How about my English medium instruction? What is it? This is an instructional approach which use English as a means, as a vehicle, as a medium to deliver the content of non-language subjects or uh, specialist subjects at post-secondary level. So here are some features of English medium instruction. First, the language of instruction is English. Second, the language objective of English medium programs, English proficiency is not aimed at. Third, who are the teachers and the students of English medium programs? The teachers are non-native speaker of English. And the students who take part in English medium programs, they already master on the content, not on the language. And the teaching materials used in English medium programs are produced or written for the native speaker of English. And then economic and political methods are the primary motives of English medium teaching. In the past decades, English medium instruction has been increasing rapidly in non-English speaking countries. Let's look at the de uh, development of English medium instruction in Europe. You see within the, uh, the period of five years, from 2002 to 2011, there was an increase of three times in the number of English medium courses offering in European higher education institutions. Uh, Asia, Asian higher education is experiencing the same trend. Let's look at some statistics about development of English medium programs in Asian uh, higher education institutions. You see, in Bangladesh, China, and Malaysia, there is a rapid English in East Asia, uh, for example, in Japan and Korea, the government provide, is providing funding for the English medium courses at universities in Korea and Japan. How about in Vietnam? You see, we are experiencing the same trend. Uh, currently, we have two English medium, uh, medium in, uh, universities. Uh, as you know, uh, we have um, English um, Vietnamese English medium instruction university in Ho Chi Minh City, and uh, one uh, another one is a German university, which 
instruct entirely all the programs in English. And then we have about seven universities are now offering English medium courses and program. And then English medium is also present in training programs, advanced programs, and especially high quality programs. So, in general terms, English medium instruction is driven, is driven by two major forces, globalization and internationalization. Right. Globalization spreads the use of English in different domains of activities, especially promotes the use of English as a medium of instruction in higher education. Internationalization includes policies and practices undertaken by academic institutions to cope with the low bar academic environment. Internationalization is directly linked to English medium teaching. What is the current push for an increase in EMI offering in Vietnamese universities. First, it's a political decision. Recently, the government has encouraged universities to introduce EMI programs. The government wants higher education institutions to provide the domestic labor market with graduates who have the competence to function effectively in the international workplace. EMI teaching is also a strategy to enhance the quality of Vietnamese higher education through internationalization. Also, the use of English in higher education is hoped to boost the language skills and confidence of Vietnamese lecturers and encourage them to engage in more research activities and research collaboration. So EMI is also a strategy to increase institutional competitiveness. In the past decades, due to expan expansion and privatization of higher education, the universities now are competing for tuition income and then for the best students. So offering EMI, EMI programs is one of the strategies that universities use to attract high performance students and also to increase the institutional income. So now I will focus on presenting partly the results of my doctoral thesis with a focus on presenting the findings from qualitative data. So my research projects pose the following research questions. It sought to understand the student motivation for enrolling in English medium programs and I, I like to know the challenges, to understand the challenges and the benefits perceived by the student enrolled in English medium programs. And so I wanted to know what were the overall attitudes of the student undertaking English medium courses. So um, this research project was carried out in 2014. This is the qualitative component. Ten focus group interviews were conducted at four universities. And then there were 52 undergraduate students undertaking business courses at two private and two public universities participating in my research project. So the first question. Student was were asked the first question, why did you undertake an EMI program? So here are the three popular responses. First one, 
students wanted to improve their English proficiency. Second, most of them had a plan to study master degree or higher degree at an English speaking country after they finish their bachelor degree. So pursuing English medium programs in Vietnam will provide them the solid background for them to further their postgraduate studies overseas. And the third reason is most of them wanted to find, to look for well-paid jobs after good get out of an English medium program. So they wanted to take a high quality program. The second thing is they hope to get great job prospects prospects after graduation. And the third is they perceive this is an elite form of education which were open to just a small number of students. So the second question, what is difficult for you when you undertake an EMI programs? So the first, uh, the greatest, one of the greatest challenge is reading the textbooks and course materials in English. Most of the course books and materials used in English medium programs are written in English. And they are the original textbooks written and produced for native speakers of English. So uh, the, they, the student report that they had a very a uh, heavy load of reading. And then when they read, they found uh, a lot of technical concepts and vocabulary that they didn't understand. And then the writing styles and convention of English, original English textbook word, very difficult to understand. So reading the course material is the first challenge the student experience when they first enroll in English medium courses. So the second, the second common response is understanding EMI lectures. The majority of lecturers delivering, delivering English medium courses are Vietnamese native speaker. So the student complained about lecturers' English. They, they said that, they reported that they didn't understand the lecture, some lecturers' pronunciation and accents. So it took them quite a while to get used to lecturers' English. A second thing, when they listened to the lecture, they didn't understand the theore uh, theoretical concepts. You know, in business, in law, there's a lot of technical vocabulary they didn't understand. And then they reported that the most lect lectures lacked elaboration. The lecturers didn't understand, uh, didn't explain a lot about technical vocabulary in English. You know, the lecturers found it very difficult to elaborate the content of the lectures. So, and the majority of students reported that they found it very difficult to take notes during the lectures. So, the lecturers was very tiring for some first year students. And in EMI courses, the student claimed that there was little interaction between teacher students and then between students and students in English. You know, they can talk a lot in Vietnamese about their technical subjects, but when it came to English, they found it very difficult to uh, converse, you know, the content in English with their peers and with the lecturers. And the majority of them turn to speak Vietnamese for, you know, uh, group work and for, um, you know, discussion with the lecturers and with peers. And then the student, especially the students at uh, the English medium in, uh, university reported that they had to complete a lot of written assignments, 
but they didn't know how to write correct, um, correctly about their technical subjects because they were not familiar with the academic writing convention. What does it mean by academic writing convention? Uh, techniques like referencing, you know, uh, citation, majority of them were not familiar with. They don't know how to cite, they don't know how to use references properly in order to avoid plagiarism. And then, but on the other hand, the student reported some benefits they perceive while undertaking English medium courses. The first one is, most of them said that they have improved their overall English skills, especially their presentation skills, and then they felt that more confidence when they present in front of a large uh, number of people in public, uh, presenting in public. Then, they perceive that they get access to elite education. For example, they said that they were lucky to study with a large number of highly skilled lecturers, highly qualified. They use, can use the original textbook in English. Why other students have to study the course book in Vietnamese version? The student in English medium course read the textbook in the original language, English. And then the students say that they enjoy better learning conditions. You know, they, they study in a small class size, class, small classes with air conditioner, and they, they enjoy the um, high speed internet access, and then they, have, they got access to the e libraries, which were open only to the English medium students. The mainstream students, surprisingly, couldn't get access to those facilities at their universities. Overall, students indicated that it was taking English medium courses, and then they believed that the benefits would outweigh the challenges. And they strongly believe in the economic returns of EMI. It means that majority of them were positive because they thought that they would get good jobs after finished universities. Overall, I can see the positive attitudes towards English medium instruction. And the majority of the students said that they were, you know, able to adapt to the new academic environment over time. So, this is the conclusion coming out of the qualitative research findings of my doctoral thesis. First one, most positive response come from the students who are ready for EMI. That is the students who have high level of English proficiency and then who have high aspiration. They are enthusiastic. They wanted to learn discipline in English. These students were high achieving high school students. They score very well at the national examination, entrance examination. They enter the EMI programs with confidence. These students expect that they would move to prestigious jobs after graduation, where English is a working language. In contrast, for students who are not expecting to move into prestigious jobs, the students who are not, who are less prof uh, proficient in English and who did less well in the university entrance test, EMI was not as rewarding. This is a take home message of my uh, doctoral research. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. I would like to welcome more questions. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay. So 
Do we have a microphone for her, please? Yeah, can you chat? So, what's your suggestion for this? So they love to learn the program, but the reality, the sad reality is they don't have enough ability of English language to learn. So what should we do as educators? Thank you. Um, from the results of my uh, research, uh, research, you can see that um, for those who don't expect to move into prestigious jobs after graduation, these students tend to have lower level of English proficiency and who score less well in the uh, national entrance test. These students, you know, English meet uh, perception and experience of lecturers who did or should be well repaired in terms of the English proficiency level for the student before they enroll in, before they start English medium courses. Repair uh, by providing the well repaired English preparatory courses for the lecturers. The majority of lecturers engaged in English medium courses and programs are Vietnamese native speakers and majority of them lack the training in EMI pedagogies. They learn the practice of teaching through errors and trial, trial and errors. So the question is now for EMI practices in Vietnamese university is to provide teacher training for the lecturers and provide English preparatory courses for the student and the academic skills for the students. So first one, teacher training and then English trainings should be in place before offering EMI courses. That, uh, those are some of the suggestions for my thesis. Any other questions, please? Yeah, please. Welcome, please. Um, I have a question. Uh, it's related to the students' difficulty in understanding the authentic text for uh, native speakers. Uh, I want to ask if there is a possibility for teachers to simplify those texts and to give these students to read and understand the gist first. And after that, give the authentic text later for them to uh, uh, have more comprehension of the native ways of expressing ideas. Is that possible for teachers to do so? Can I confirm my understanding, please? You said that... Uh, that the students have difficulties understanding the native uh, text, the authentic, for them to understand the yeah. text first, and yeah. then give them the authentic text later. Yeah, is you, that possible? Yeah, yeah, you are exactly right. This is one of the suggestions coming out of my thesis. The use of English textbook in the original without modification and simplification presented a lot of problems for students. It's a good idea to, to simplify, the, you know, modify the English textbook to suit the student language levels. This is one of the suggestions, you know, we have the same ideas. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. So, do, any questions? The last question. Thank good you. morning. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you for your interesting presentation. And I have a question, which is not quite um, very related to yeah. this. But um, as you said, that English medium instruction is good. Uh, sorry, Vietnamese medium instruction is good, but English one is better. But my question is that if we consider our current context in Vietnamese universities and high schools, we can see that not 
many of our students can communicate and use English very fluently if we only use English as the only one, only medium instruction yeah. in teaching and learning. So can we in some way use Vietnamese? Why not? Yeah, I, I say that. But I want to uh, ask for your suggestion or advice that how much Vietnamese a consider with using English in our language teaching and learning. That is my first thing. That is your suggestion. Yeah, yeah. How about the, per, the percentage of Vietnamese versus English in our language teaching? The second question is that um, returning to the questions that <laughs> sorry, sorry, we have. Sorry, can I cut in? Yeah. I would like to answer your first question because, you know, uh, it's very difficult for me to, to remember two questions at the same time. Okay, so after that. Yeah, yeah. Let me answer your first question. Thank like, you. Uh, for my study, what I see is that the radical move into Eng English medium instruction in Vietnamese university presents have presented a lot of problems. Most universities nowadays encourage lecturers and students to use 100%, you know, English in the EMI classroom. This is not a good idea. When the students are not ready, when the lecturers are not ready for EMI. So back to your questions, back to your suggestion. So my, my findings and my suggestion is that the implementation of EMI needs time and takes time. It depends on the level of English proficiency of the academic skills of the student. It depends on the institutional resources. So why don't we implement it gradually? For example, first, just 30% of EMI in the classroom and then 70% of uh, English medium instruction and then when the level of English of both lecturers and students are increased and then we implement 50% of EMI for example with the PowerPoint slide in English and then with the instruction language in Vietnamese and then gradually the student can catch up with you know, EMI in Vietnamese classroom, in Vietnamese um, uh, classroom. And then when the level of English proficiency of student and the lecturer are, uh, are higher, and then we will introduce 50, um, from um, 80 to 50% to 100% of English medium classes. And then I think this is much better than radically move to EMI without proper reparation for EMI. So actually, the students and lecturers are not ready for EMI yet in Vietnamese uh, context, you know? And it presents a lot of problems that needs further research. This is um, the results of my doctoral thesis. Thank you very much for your questions. And uh, I think uh, I should uh, close my presentation here to give time to other presenters. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Le Thi Thi Nhung, for your remarkable speech. Also, I would like to thank you all the smart questions from the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind attention. And now it's time for coffee break. It's about 15 minutes. Before the breaks, I would like to inform, uh, inform you the following matters. First, please be noted that according to our gender, after the break, we are going to the concurrent sessions. Please take a look at the topics of concurrent session in your handout and join the session after the break. Uh, secondly, for the concurrent session, the presenter should contact the technical volunteer in each room 
to copy their file to the computer for saving time and avoid technical hitches. Also, please be noted that the technical demonstration from the conference sponsor as well as the conference proceedings are now being displayed by the mentor of the Grand Hall and ready at hand for your reference and purpose. Thank you.